I opened the store just 25 years ago. I had a mail order business called Master the Game in the back of EGM and GamePro. The store is a little bit like a museum, and I would imagine most game store owners feel that way. I really just love being around people passionate about the same things I'm passionate about. <laughs> I mean, when I was dreaming about, oh, I'd like to have a game company, my dreams were walking into a store and seeing it on a shelf. By the time I got to where we were actually shipping our own games, it was like, okay, we should do this all digitally. You could buy video games on your Xbox over the internet. Oh, yeah, I can download this game. I think the benefit to the consumer about digital distribution is freedom. Anyone can make anything. You can get this game out there to people. Well, if I buy it, what happens? What do you own? Well, it's not an artifact that can be passed from one hand to the other. Yes, you have those things, but now no one else can. You kind of get to come back and relive those moments, times that were a little less uh, stressful than they are today. I didn't think I wanted to be a business owner, but I love it. I don't think I could go back now. I think I mostly download games now. Maybe you don't want to own all these pieces of plastic and paper. Games and the fact that they're sort of like ever changing, ever developing, it's not something you can really like latch on to and say like this is the definitive thing, it's like ever changing. Everything in the world is moving toward replacing people and having to pay them. It's not about the game, it's about how they came across the game. My first console I remember playing was the Atari 2600. I remember saying like, wow, look at the graphics. I never thought it would mount to anything. He informs us they want to pay those $30 million. It was like, what? Video games vastly differ from every other kind of media. A good video game is probably the hardest thing to make. The whole point of a game was literally shooting pixelated aliens that were falling out of the sky. Nowadays, not only do we know why those aliens are falling out of the sky, we know the names of their moms. And we know we have to destroy all of them. They've evolved into truly global experiences. It's a borderline religious experience. And just something about blowing your friend in half, nothing is more satisfying. I have lifelong friends that I've met just playing together online. This is the ultimate example of art and science working together. It's making a movie times a thousand. Back in the early days, we really did look forward to a day where video games would be interactive movies. Video games in the next 30 to 40 years are going to be unimaginable, where you can live the dream that you've always wanted to live. Everyone has a history. I met a couple of guys, and they were both from IBM. So what are you doing? I'm in the computer business. In what kind of business? Computer business. What is the name of the company? Commodore. That's nothing. This will never make it. And that was the mentality of IBM. For now, the closest target for Jack was not IBM, but Steve Jobs. We were working on a product at Tramel's request that would kill Apple. It was called the Apple Killer. It was supposed to be the next generation consumer computer. We had a capability of doing audio and video that, that was above what Apple had at the time. The VIC-20 was not certainly a business machine. It was really a home computer. The most important thing is to be able to compete with yourself. If you stop competing with yourself, you fail. I'm a believer in pushing real hard to even obsolete your own if necessary. Once the Commodore 64 was out, it just killed the VIC-20 and started selling faster than ever. Commodore was selling over a half a million computers per month. I felt that's, that's quite, quite good. The C64 was the Apple killer. Apple would have to wait until the 21st century to achieve anything like that. The Commodore 64 is considered the largest selling single model computer. Jack makes no secret that uh, business is war. There, there are stories and some are true, most are true. <laughs> the president of 
the home computer division at, at uh, Texas Instruments came storming into our booth, raging at Jack, telling him, you can't do this, you're gonna screw up the market. And Jack just smiled and said, yes, I am. In business, you're in business to make money, not to make friends. I'm always running across people who have learned to program on the VIC-20 or Commodore 64. Everyone remembers their first computer and it always has a special place in their hearts. It started with a simple concept. One man, 30 days, buy all the Nintendo games without using the internet in any way. Boom. There's no cheat codes, there's no Game Genie, there's no extra lives. Some way, somehow, he'll succeed at what he wants to do with this. This journey is going to be incredible. I'm going to literally go across the country. There are precisely three things he's passionate about. Star Wars, rock and roll, and video games. And the big boss at the end of the game is the ticking clock. If he doesn't beat that, he loses a chance at a dream. I think the collecting of the games, I think will be the easier part for him. I'm going to get to see all these amazing game stores, all these different types of people. Regardless of whether he gets all the games, it's just going to be this massive game loving. It's just going to be fun. And then we started asking ourselves why it was Nintendo. Why did we pick Nintendo over any other game company? Because I think that's the system everyone can relate to. Everyone loves the NES. For a period of time there, Nintendo was a word used to describe video games in general. Every game they came out with really had a level of success to one degree or another. And you didn't just play for three or four days. You played for weeks, sometimes months. Think about Mario and Zelda and only being limited to that space. So everything had to be so melodic. These are cool items that document historical information. If someone were to show me a library of NES games in a file on their computer, I'm not impressed. If someone were to show me the artifacts, that's what matters. Anyone can take a picture. Again, I'll say it, man. Life is too short to be doing something that you don't want to do every day. The NES is the system responsible for the industry for what it is today. That's the system everyone can relate to. Everyone loves the NES. Why don't you show me some of the games you have the world record on? Well, I have it on Zexon, Yars Revenge, Star Master, Star Voyager, Skiing. I guess games on every one of these roads. Cubert, Pitfall, Laser Blast, Kangaroo, E.T., Chopper Command. That it? And of course the favorite, <laughs> Dragster up in the corner. of power and performance that the Amiga computer had in 1985. No one. Here comes this thing that just demolishes what we think a home computer can do. It just completely changed everything. Stereo, television, multitasking, graphics. There was a whole generation of artists who found a use for computers. That was giving people a tool they had never had before. This is it. If you were a creative guy, if you were a computer geek, this, this was it. This was Nirvana. Later that day, we find out that there was a big layoff coming. And it was all very scary. We're here to introduce our new Amiga One X1000 computer. Max Blade would swing through the room, and anybody above that height got their head taken off. The patient's terminal. It's living in spite of them.
1981, the arcade scene was very big. It was an absolute magical place. It was sort of like my second home in a way. You didn't know what to expect. You'd walk in and there was always a chance there'd be a new game out there. The game would arrive and you'd have like people stacked up and lined up waiting to play. You could not get on that game. There was a line out to the door. And it was just a different era. Send your playing techniques or high scores to the International Scoreboard in Ottumwa. I was the official scorekeeper for the video game industry. Here are the top finalists. We had a lot of phone calls and then one day it was from someone with Life Magazine who wanted to do a story on video games. The 20 best video game players in the world getting together. And there's people from all over. It's California, Florida, mm -hmm. I think one guy's from Alaska. These are the all pro guys. The video games, this is the equivalent of the Sgt. Pepper's album. Are the players ready? All right! Everybody wanted to be better than everybody else. Everybody wanted to showcase. If you couldn't play a video game, you were nothing. I used to go and play a game to destroy the game. To an arcade owner, I am the worst nightmare. I could walk into a strange arcade and step up to a game, and I could have half an arcade full of people around watching. Everywhere they went, people poured attention on them. Girls fell in love with them. Adventures happened to them. If you don't have a t-shirt, we know about it. I've never seen groupies before. Yeah, there were groupies. We were all young and, and crazy, and we've all had a chance to grow up. We turned into productive members of Society that were non-violent. Video games made me feel important again. They probably did impact each other's lives. Back in the day, your dad was a legend. He was known worldwide as the guy that was able to rock this game like nothing else. You can teach a monkey how to play a certain number of rooms, but you cannot teach a man how to play berserk. It's the hot new buzz, video games. With 95% or more of the market, we were the video game industry, but then it changed. Sega! It was hard to build a major video game system. None of us really knew if Sega was going to be a success. The challenges we had were the very strong presence of Nintendo. We needed something to compete with Mario. Sonic the Hedgehog. A hedge what? established a rule that Nintendo was not going to get pushed around. We're at war, guys. we got to win this. It became a kind of spy versus spy. They had these large inflatable balloons like Sonic. He had them deflated. A lot of yelling and screaming at various events. They were furious with us. I did not expect the U.S. Congress to get involved. We sent a message to Sega that we were going to continue to fight him. There was a lot at stake. It was unbelievable. You got to be ready to fight. There is a machine that you must operate, but you have to figure out what machine it is, what its function is, what it does, what you need to put in it or on it or alongside it. You have to figure out what that thing is. It lets you see other people's points of view. You get to see the worlds that other people live in. You, you get to visit other people's imagination. To be able to type commands to a computer in something that looked like English, and to have it respond to you with lines of text telling you what happens next, that um, captivated people.
when I knew that it was possible to make text games, I've never looked back. It's something I want to do for my whole life. It was an itch that I didn't know that I had until I started scratching it. Now it won't go away. It's a rash, I guess. It just fired everybody's imaginations. This is next level stuff. It was perhaps the most difficult project that I have worked on in my career. The PlayStation の発表を聞いたときに、本当に自分がやりたかったその格レンボがまあポリゴンとテクスチャーでできるっていうので、すごくその時は本当に。One of the things we can say about PlayStation throughout the history is there's always been innovation there. The concept of storytelling in video games manifested itself to a really meaningful extent, probably for the first time. We always wanted to push what we could do. Our world was opening up. The launch of PlayStation in Japan was a fantastically exciting time. We had a market that was really taking off. If you are going to enter a new market, you have to do things differently. PlayStation really made gaming cool. It really captured people's imagination. It was an amazing time as a game creator and as a game player. But the PlayStation started to take shape. Everybody talked about the dinosaur. Maybe we could do really good computer graphics for video games. There was the technical aspects of the 3D. Which were brutal, and so we had to figure it all out. It was definitely a difficult period. What we didn't expect was that it would be such an incredible success. PlayStation has set the benchmark for what modern video games can and should be. Under that landfill is a burial site of an entire industry. Growing up, you always read little rumors about it. The dreams of a generation buried underneath the garbage. You can hear it screaming or something. I don't know. Billions of cartridges out in the desert. The worst video game ever. E.T. for Atari. It was bad, brutal, unfair. Didn't make a lot of sense. How did a company that was so innovative fail so miserably? This is a company that made three hundred and seventy-five million dollars, the fastest-growing company in American history. That was super exciting to be the pioneers in that field. It just blew people away. And this was what I was made to do. The word hubris comes to mind. If the quotas were met, I'd throw a kegger. Over there is where the hot tub was. These guys are the lifeblood of the business. They do what they want to do. Engineers as rock stars. DT comes out. It's a huge hit, and we want to do the cartridge. There'll be a Learjet waiting for you. Be ready to propose the game to Spielberg. It was twenty to thirty million dollars. It was some crazy number. We had to have the game out for Christmas. Typical VCS game took five or six months. And this was going to be in five weeks. Yeah, I can do that. Everybody I knew got ET that Christmas. People aren't liking it. One of the worst nights of my life. The train is derailing. I could be single-handedly responsible for toppling a billion-dollar industry. Useless, worthless product. How do you get rid of it? Said you wanted to know where the Atari's are. <laughs>
Wait, this is the spot? The concern is they also may have something else buried in the landfill. We might crack open a sealed tomb of mercury lace pigs. What's the last time you saw a line of people waiting to get into a dump? They want some kind of tangible evidence. It's like opening the Ark of the Covenant. The burial in Almogordo is Paris funeral. This has sort of felt like a religious pilgrimage to me. Is my face going to melt off? I don't know. E.T. comes out, the industry dies. That's what people will remember it for.